If you're a young person, certainly you've been contemplating your future. Or if you're a parent, you're probably reflecting on the future of your child or ward. And this really because the finance minister uh, told us this last week, a week ago today, the stark reality of uh, public sector employment, that there are simply no public sector jobs anymore. And young people have been advised to pursue entrepreneurship. Is that realistic? Let's hear some young entrepreneurs who've been speaking at the Ghana Economic Forum. Conversations about growing individual businesses and entrepreneurship always comes up when youth employment is mentioned, as well as on forums that discuss youth issues. A few days ago, the finance minister, Ken Furiata, uh, resurrected such conversations again when he called for young persons or individuals to venture into entrepreneurship because the payroll is full. Well, this generated a lot of reaction from both young and old. And before we became Ghana, so to speak, uh, we were already entrepreneurs. I, I, I think it's time to go back to our roots in terms of before we had the public service, what were we doing? We may not like what the minister said, but I think that is the reality and it's our truth. The question though is, what are the ways and means that have been provided? You have the young entrepreneurs who have got dreams and possibly they will need to produce. When they produce, what type of commodity are they producing? And which market are they going to sell these products? For some, government efforts in engaging actors in entrepreneurship keep failing. It's a good discussion that is all, always um, held around the country every year. But in my opinion, the reality on the ground is not what I experience when I come for these programs. I face so many issues, especially as a woman, in trying to build my business, especially in a male-dominated um, industry like the financial services industry. I hear lots of talk on we are helping, gender equality and all that, but I don't experience it as a reality on the ground. Some young entrepreneurs also believe that the lip service on the side of government is becoming too unbecoming. They expect more from the government. There's things I'm hearing here for the first time that I didn't even know exist in Ghana because I had sort of given up. Regulatory, taxation, these are things that I think if the government helped us on, we would be okay. I'm not asking the government for money, but don't take the little money that I have. You are a young entrepreneur. What would you say to the young people who have been asked to also venture into it? You go into business knowing that there is a need, a solution, a bridge that you're creating. And so end-to-end -end is required that you have a good system and then a good structure such that your, your business can exist in your absence. So we've heard from government reiterating the fact that young people should get into entrepreneurship. And we've also had the opportunity to speak to some of these young entrepreneurs who've also made their concerns known. But what would you also say? I'm sure the conversation will continue from here. I'm Naniki Amensa Brampa, TV3 Kempinski, Accra. Some very interesting thoughts. So we still have our two members of parliament with us and we are joined by Mami Awinado, who is an international trade consultant. She also addressed the Ghana Economic Forum speaking about youth in agriculture. So I'll start with her. Uh, so Mami, thanks very much for joining us. So the thoughts of the young people there, you spoke about youth in agriculture mm -hmm. and then the advice that young people should become entrepreneurs. Is that a realistic advice when a lot of young people see what the prospects are in public sector? A lot of people go there, they become prominent, they become you know, well to do, there are perks that come with the job. How do you juxtapose those two and justify that young people should become entrepreneurs? Is that a, a running theme? Right. Um, so with the entrepreneurial situation, if you think about it, actually data actually shows that um, one in three Ghanaians, Ghanaian youth are, um, are self-employed. So I don't even think that um, it's a thing of going into entrepreneurship. The issue is that what kind of environment has been created to facilitate that? So it's very easy to say, go and become an entrepreneur and then go and employ people. But I know what entrepreneurs are going through every single day. We are part of a small business. You have to employ people. Just yesterday, um, my friend who has a law firm, you know, Latin law firm, he's employed two people. And he has to pay, he had to pay his tax yesterday. And people are going up and they're paying so much in tax. You have to pay salaries, right? 
And I know that there was a startup act by, um, I cannot see all the parties that were part of it, but there was Justice of Fair and a bunch of people. And to date, they haven't had any attention from the government to have this thing passed. So the question is that um, it's very problematic because we need to stop telling people what the right thing is when the situation is not like that on the ground. Because it's, it's quite, it's, I don't say insulting, but it patronizes people's intelligence, right? Because we are also on the ground doing entrepreneurs, like entrepreneurs are there, and they see that the system is not working. And now people are asked to, oh, go and become an entrepreneur, you'll be your own boss. That is not all entrepreneurship is, it's solving problems. But how do you solve problems when the engine is supposed to help facilitate you to solve the problems? It's becoming a stumbling block. Because now you're supposed to compete with bigger businesses because we are signing all these commercial contracts with foreign, foreign um, states. And then now if a Ghanaian business starts, you have to, you have to compete with the Turkish, they're competing with the Indians. And so now imagine a small business, how do you even thrive? So how is it realistic? That's why I'm concerned. Mm. I'm concerned that they're they are, they are selling an idea to the young people and then they will get into the system and they'll see what the people who have already been in there are going through. And it's not what the situation is very hard. What? What should the, I know we've talked a lot about what should the government be doing, but realistically, can you give us maybe, you know, your top three things right. that government should do to make the environment worthwhile for young people right. who are setting up their own businesses? Right. And so one of the things is to please take up the Startup Act that was um, formulated by a bunch of um, um, entrepreneurs and, and, and businesses. And so just look at the act, it talks about these tax exemptions, what government can do with tax breaks, you know, to help because we give exemptions to these big companies to come in and our small businesses are suffering. So please look at the Startup Act for one. The second thing I wanted to say is we spoke about agribusiness and the, the idea is that the agriculture sector has the potential to create multiple jobs for our youth, but we also need to understand that agriculture is not just farming. So maybe people are saying that agriculture is not attractive to the young people because um, they've sold the idea that it's you being a farmer on the soil using a hoe, right? But agriculture is so broad, and that's why Brazil, for one, um, is, I think they're like the third um, highest exporters of food globally, right? And so I was telling someone that the cooperative, um, the idea of cooperatives, that's one of the models that Brazil used. So you have about 60,000 people who have ownership in one cooperative. And so maybe they are producing this chicken, this um, well, there's a pig greed, they are planting maize and stuff. So you have engineers even in agriculture. So you can be an engineer in an agriculture space. You can be, a, some, can be doing marketing in the agriculture space. Agriculture is so diverse that it's beyond just the farming. So one of the key things, the second thing is please, like the agriculture sector, we need to invest more in that space. That's all we have pretty much. Uh, you know, as a, as a region, it contributes heavily to our GDP, and yet food is so expensive. So I wanted to encourage the um, government with that element of doing that. And the th third key thing I was going to say is with the educational system, we need to find a way to be able to connect um, tertiary institutions with companies right when they start from first year. So you're not waiting for someone to now finish school, and then they've never done an internship, they've never worked before. Because when you go for a job, they'll always ask, five year experience, 10 year experience, right? So why don't we just try to say, okay, since we have so many foreign companies coming to Ghana, when you negotiate these contracts, have a policy within the contract that says, when you come in, you have to have um, a system whereby you take in some of our university students, right? Whether it's during the long breaks or on the side, give them training, whether it's um, internship, volunteer work, and prepare them for the, the real um, working field. So you're actually connecting private sector and companies to schools. Mm -hmm. So that people now are ready for the real world. Whether it's a university student about whether they're doing agriculture, they should have seen a farm. That, that's really, I guess, one of the missing links. So right. let me come to Honorable Opoku yeah. here, uh, who is the MP from Price. So, uh, and certainly following what government has been saying they're doing in Parliament. The mid-year review budget pointed out to a number of things that the government said uh, it was going to do. It talked about a national youth policy. It talked about, you know, employment and job creation and, and uh, you know, policies to encourage young people to have um, sustainable jobs, green jobs and sustainable agriculture, skills development. But I think Mami has raised a very important thing, and some of the young entrepreneurs mentioned it. They are not getting the tax breaks. They are not getting the capital investment. 
and the reliefs that will allow them to grow. They are paying corporate taxes, they are paying SNIT for their workers, they are paying salaries, they are paying electricity, high electricity bills, water bills, high rent. And then, of course, they, they, are, they are competing with these huge Middle Eastern companies, mm. European companies, Baltic companies, who are getting all these breaks. It doesn't seem fair. Well, I, I, I appreciate the concerns of Mami and many more young um, uh, entrepreneurs out there. Um, I, in fact, I think we need to appreciate the fact that um, entrepreneurs are doing pretty well in, 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 our, in our country. I mean, uh, look at the real estate industry. Uh, there are many more young people there who are doing well. Talk about Saka Homes and all of that. We don't know how much <laughs> debt they are in. No, they no. may be looking see, good, but we don't um, know how much debt uh, no, these see, individuals are, are, are in. If you are running a business and you owe debt, uh, it is not really a bad thing. I mean, of course, people borrow money from the banks to, to run their businesses. People, and, and of course, uh, if you are in the services industry or you are in the manufacturing industry, you go and pick money from somewhere, manufacture, sell, and you make your money and pay. So that, that, that is the challenge. And uh, you see, um, I also appreciate the concerns from, from some young people. But um, I think there's, 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 there's a gradual appreciation of the concerns and the solution to it. For instance, one, you talked about agriculture. We have all accepted that our economy or we, we live in a more uh, agricultural-based uh, society. For instance, in my constituency, 70% of the people there are farmers. What is lacking is linking the business aspect to the farming and the agribusiness bit of it, where we are able to identify, we are able to identify the value chain. So in my place... So what's being I done to provide the value chain? Can, Since we know I'm, that's the issue, I, we know I, there's planting there. for food and jobs. I get there. So, for instance, in my constituency, we grow a lot of bananas. But how the bananas get onto the market has always been problematic. So we have bad rules of which government is trying to fix and all of that. But the support that is needed for these young entrepreneurs is also springing up. Today, government has introduced the business resource centers in some major districts in this country. I am putting up a structure, government is putting up a structure in my constituency that is about 60% complete. Go to the north, you see a business resource center being built by government. And the, the resource center is going to serve as a one-stop shop for all activities. So if you want to register your company, you go there, if you want taxes, you go there. If you need support from Ghana Enterprises Agency, you go there and all of that. That is the, 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 the function of the Business Resource Center, which is somewhat moving um, uh, the support services from Accra to the district. So more like decentralizing support for business enterprises. Just in the media budget, government talked about the Obatampake budget, where it wants to pump a lot of money into agriculture. And I always have said that, Agreg is the solution, because that is what we have. And it's something that we need to hold on to. See? But isn't it slow in delivering the gains that... It is not. ...that is Mame not. is talking about? For instance... Because it, it's, it seems, after being in office for hmm. almost four and a half years, the finance minister comes to do the media review mm -hmm. and say that they are working on a plan that will deliver what two million jobs. Um, okay, it says government has announced its intention to create at least one million jobs within the next three years, and we know that jobs have been an issue for you know more than five years. You see, um, Jifa, as for jobs. You cannot just solve the, I mean, the, the unemployment situation. In the, I'm not too sure. In the US, and I'm, I read that from the media in the, in budget the, in, 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 more, in, the, in the more advanced societies, there are still people who are un unemployed. I mean, go to the UK, you still find people who are unemployed, people who are not getting jobs to do. Go to the USA, it is happening there. So I'm not saying that that should be there. The, 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 but government must always find a way or, or must always find solutions to the challenges that confront us each and every day of our lives. And that's why I've talked about the butter packet. See, agribusiness and, 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 and the support that 
government is pumping into agribusiness, for me, is huge. Today, go to Dowenya. You realize a lot of these um, uh, greenhouse farms are being built in Dowenya. Go to the University of Cape Coast. Greenhouse farms have been built in the University of Cape Coast. Go to Kenya University. Greenhouse farms are being built. Government, with the support of Exim Bank, contracted a, 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 an agri institution, agri, agri impact of world, yes, agri impact, where it is now training young people in how to manage a greenhouse facility. When you go, when, when you, you take part in this training exercise, and um, they now give you support in terms of putting up a, a greenhouse facility for you so that you are able to produce the vegetables needed. See, the truth that must be told that is that in the public sector, it's not everybody that is, that is doing well. I mean, I know people who work in the public sector would take 1,008 Ghana cities a month. Okay, well, come to, I didn't want to raise the public mm -hmm. sector thing yet. I, I wanted you to address so, the, the job creation strategies that government says uh, you've raised some of them. Let me, let me, but just one more thing. NAPCO is ending at the end of Oct October. Yes. So we are going to have a crop of NAPCO trainees who I'm sure are thinking and worried about their future. What does government say to them? So, because once the finance minister says the public sector payroll is full, many of those NAPCO trainees were hoping to get onto the public sector payroll. But you see, from right from last year, there's been an attempt by government. There's been, uh, 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 and it's been successful, where some NAPCO trainees are being absorbed into the mainstream government jobs. So, Jinare uh, uh, um, wants to recruit. Food. What? The one that is full already. Of course, I mean people, minister. people go on retirement, and always there will be services needed. I think what the finance minister said was that government cannot just create opportunities where there, there, there's no work to be done for people to be employed. You understand? What we need to appreciate is that it is the responsibility of government to create an environment for businesses to flourish. Today. In the wisdom of the president, one district, one factory, should be solving most of these major problems, and that is why. Uh, but it as seems we speak, also very slow it because is not. I mean, because it's not all the factories that have been one, built from oh, scratch. One zero eight factories, one zero eight factories have been built. What is lacking, and just like Commander Sugar Factory, is the support in terms of the raw materials that are needed to feed most of these plants. I know one district, one factories that have been put up where the factories are operating at 20% level, are operating at 15% level because the raw materials are not there. What kind of support can we give to the youth to engage in commercial farming, to appreciate, give them tractors, give them support in terms of employment? I mean, we can even, we can even set up a system where people are employed onto some major farms, paid by government somewhat. I mean, through, let's say, YEA or NYA, where after the, 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 the farming season, some government takes a portion of the, 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 the profit uh, from, from the venture so that labor on the farmlands do not become the burden of the young man who is now finding his feet. You understand? Government must find a way of providing tractors. So to that agri ministry, I'm told that by next month, there will be a lot of tractors in where it is at a subsidized price and it's meant Hopefully for, politicians will not it is, consume it is not. that. Now, now, okay, so, uh, now so to be able to benefit... you can wrap up benefit, on your point, and now let, just let mommy come back in. So, so you, you appreciate that government is trying to find solutions to the many problems, especially uh, uh, not concentrating only in Accra, but trying to decentralize the services that it has to provide to, to young entrepreneurs. We still have a long way to go, but there has been some efforts, and I know mommy appreciates that, <laughs> there has been some efforts by government, and, and we, we, we need more. I, I am so passionate about young people and, 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 and job creation. I spoke um, last two days at the uh, Africa Youth Connect oh, yeah. on, um, okay. on, 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 on labor mobility. And, and I think that one of our major challenges is our educational system. The educational system... Okay, you, let, let me hold you on the educational yeah. system. Mami, uh, you can make your point and yes. then I'll bring in Honorable yes. Adams. Yes, yes. Please. Um, and, and, and sir, with all due respect, I do, I do know that government is trying. 
But I think one of the things that we need to also clear up is when you spoke about real estate and people are doing well in the real estate space. If you look at the news now, Accra is the second most expensive um, city in the world. And, and one of the things that they used to make this, um, you know, to, for the data to even come to this conclusion was real estate. That is so expensive. And because uh, the cost of living is so high, you cannot afford. Now, if you read a lot of the island papers, one of the things that drive high real estate prices in the region, especially when it's a country that is um, not developed, is money laundering. So the real estate space is not um, a conducive space for entrepreneurs because there's no affordable housing. A lot of entrepreneurs are living with their families. 40-year-old people have moved back home with their wife and their kids staying with their parents. So real estate, even that sector alone, is so congested because a lot of the apartments that you see springing up are not affordable. You can't even trace the owners of these apartments. We don't want to go deep because we have to now bring out all these island papers. And there are facts showing this. So what I'm saying is that I know government is trying. That like you came up with a whole NAPCO idea, right? But the problem is that government solutions are never sustainable. You know why? Because a lot of them are centered on, we need to do this quickly while we are in power so we can win again. Sustainable solutions come when there's serious engagement with private sector. When you know that, okay, you know one thing, finance minister will have a session with SMEs, not selected SMEs who are probably, you know, connected and stuff, but really SMEs on the ground, have a session with them, ask them questions, what can we do to help you? Government and private sector are not opposites. There shouldn't be a dichotomous state of the government and the private sector. They should be one in hand. But I tell you something, I came back to Ghana, and I shared this one even this, um, on TV3 once, I came back to Ghana with three degrees. I was, un I was looking for a job for close to two years. And suddenly you go to a space, as a woman, even men try to take advantage of you. Jobs are sexualized in Ghana. If women have to tell you what they go through, the young people, it's very hard. You need to report these things. I mean, you know, so the thing is that I go to a job. No, I'm just trying to tell you something. I go for a job. No, no, I sir. Mean, it, I, it, I want it to pays, tell you. It it's her, it's, it, it, badly. I mean, if yes. somebody exploits you sexually before he gives you a job, report such a person. But, no, but can I be, let's be frank, right? When there's a, when there's a cost of, when survival is the main thing in the economy, right? People, even morals don't exist. It's survival of the fittest. That's how Ghana is now. You just need to survive. So a lot of young women, yeah, and this is true, and I'm going to say this because as people are going through this, a lot of jobs in Ghana are sexualized. And a lot of young men are even saying, look, Ghanaian girls, and you see, it sounds like a joke online, but you should go and hear the conversations online. Young guys are like, hey, the girls are very materialistic. We can't afford. A lot of young boys go to the malls and see. They're all behind laptops looking for ways to what, get a credit card to go and buy a phone and stuff. They don't have mentorship. They don't have guidance. That's why I'm saying that. So today, let's just all be frank about the situation. This is not an MPP, NDC problem. I'm not too sure yeah. we're here doing MPP, NDC. Yeah, no, no, I'm not no, saying no, you are doing it. I'm, I'm, I'm just yeah. putting it out there. No, I'm saying that. I, I'm, also told let's be, I'm, not, I'm not saying government. This is put in place by government. Yes. I, I've appreciated the concerns that you have raised. Yes. I mean, there's a major challenge in that space. How do we support young entrepreneurs? How do we support people who want to do their own business? Yes. I've talked about business resource center. I don't know if you are aware of business. The business. No, so this is, even this is news to me. So even information. Well, and see, so even the center, has it, has it been set up here? Yes. Or? I mean, go to the north. We have a business resource center set up in the, go to Kumasi. In so my place, the youth, So that means the youth are, the, that means the okay. youth are not. The, yeah, so confused. on our yeah. <laughs> the unawareness of a lot of things yeah. is because of how we have handled it. I think the packaging has been so poor. Mm. Uh, let me say that I have my own thoughts, especially how we could use our Greek to drive employment and development of a country. You are, you are originally a scientist, yeah. so you understand and, and, the science of the I'm a farmer by choice. You're a farmer as well. As by choice. Mm -hmm. And I don't like it when governments come up with all kinds of policies that spreads all over the country. No. I don't think that we need to even have government pushed, private sector led farming in every part of the country. I think as a country, for example, we can identify and say three regions basically have the potential for poultry. Mm. Maybe Bono region, Greater Accra, and maybe let's say Uti or Volta and that government is going to create all the necessary logistical support. Land, electricity, roads, veterinary services, and everything will be there. So this is space for you young persons to just go in, even uh, day-old chicks and the rest will be provided. 
processing is available. You raise your beds. There's all kinds of support services there. You process the beds there. If it is for egg, if it's for uh, uh, chicken, they are processed, they are storage, there's transportation. So from these three regions, that gets all the support in terms of poultry. You can supply cheaper protein uh, uh, products from poultry, both eggs and processed chicken to all the other regions. You pick another region and think that this can do well in maybe goats, sheep, and cattle. You support in terms of resources and logistics. You pick another area and think that this can do well in rice. But if we continue and say, oh, we have planting for food and job, we are going to be spreading some fertilizer here, some fertilizer there, and which gets smuggled. We are going to say, we are bringing in tractors. Uh, tractors, subsidized tractor, you can't even afford. If they will tell you it's subsidized, but even at the rate that is subsidized, a young person cannot even afford to buy one tractor, let alone two, let alone three that you need for various uh, uh, services. So governments should have a rethink and begin to zonalize their support and know that we have village. This is poultry village and that you can see from maybe huge acreage is just poultry. That is what they do. So. The best are raised there, those that are layers are there, those that are for broilers are there. Government, through whatever support, will have huge storage facility. So there's slaughtering, there's processing, there's packaging, and there's distribution. So all the chains that we are talking about, you can redistribute and feed the whole country. If you go to developed countries, take America as an example. You have every food item in every state but it is not in every state that you find such food item being grown because they have a network of distribution. So you don't need to support poultry farming in every part of the country. You don't need to do that. When you do that, it becomes very little. The cost will still be high because veterinary services will be high. That veterinary officer will have to now have a moto and move from one farm to another that is so separated by long distance. So you go to this small little farm that has just about 1,000 beds, attend to them. Then you have to ride on your motor for maybe another 25 or 30 kilometers to go and attend to another farm far away. But if you have huge facility that is a village of poultry farming, veterinary services are there, processing is there, electricity, everything is supplied, done through proper investment, then cost. Unit cost to each farmer becomes lower because that veterinary officer don't have to travel from one point to the other. So you're not going to spend fuel riding your car or motorbike going around from farm to farm. Services will easily be available. We have not thought of that. We keep just spreading, oh, planting for food and job, and they cannot properly even account and have tracking. Uh, the greenhouse thing that my brother talked about, use countries that use that as their first line of agriculture is because of their weather situation. We are lucky we have a natural weather that you can have more than 80% of your food needs grown without greenhouse. But if we want to export... No, I'm if, coming to that. I'm to coming business, to that. Because if, I visited no. Maflex Farms uh, uh, near Georgia mm -hmm. and fantastic the, setup. But the, if the, the gentleman I, tells you how much he has had to invest in these almost 35 greenhouses he yes. has there, Expensive. even the exim uh, facility that yeah. Needs, yeah, that's not, will, will exactly. not will not be able to get you through. That is why I'm saying that. You see, the reason why greenhouse has become the order of the day is also because of our failure to check the environmental situation, the way we are destroying our environment. And so therefore, if you leave some of these to grow naturally, mm. it ends up being exposed to all the other environmental hazards. So you end up not meeting the international standards. That is why we now have to go through very expensive modes of farm. It's not only to create the appropriate temperature. All that I'm trying to say is that why is food so expensive in Ghana? A lot of the foods that we eat are not supposed to be coming from the greenhouse uh, uh, sources. But food is expensive. So let's look at tackling local and maybe the uh, West African needs first, mm -hmm. even before we think about the European markets. Okay. Mm -hmm. The local, the local market alone is big. 
very, very big that we can produce at a lesser cost rather than the little that we have. So you can leave the uh, uh, greenhouse space to experts. Mm. What is happening if you go to even the area of uh, rice? Government have borrowed money. And we are paying interest on it. Has created uh, uh, irrigable lands and has given off huge sizes of these lands to experts. Many of these persons have signed agreements with other international bodies. So you may see huge uh, banana production. But, but it's it is not, it's not, it's not from the local, it's not consumed also even locally. It is going out also. You can see high levels, high volumes being recorded. Rice is being produced in huge quantities, but some of it is going out because they know the nutritional value of what is coming out from our soils. And so we really need to have this whole rethink. And it can employ a lot of our young people. Okay, I'll come to you. It, back. I'll come back to you. Let's take a break. I'll come back to Mame about whether really young people want to be engaged in agriculture because that's also a separate, a separate conversation. You're watching the key points on TV3 and 3FM. We take a break. We'll be right back. Thanks for staying with us here on TV3's uh, Key Points, and we are also live on 3FM 92.7. It's been an interesting backroom discussion. Uh, just two messages that we have here. Uh, this one from Mahama and Salaga says, Jifa, for local entrepreneurs to grow, government needs to build the roads and ensure affordable and sustainable supply of electricity and water. And... Um, Another message that we have here, okay, it seems to have, uh, you know, vanished. So I'll get that. Once I get that, I'll bring that uh, to you. Okay, it's popped up now. It says, um, it's not true that NAPCO trainees are being absorbed into the public sector. Trainees who were made to write aptitude tests still remain in limbo. And so the MP needs to correct that. Uh, that's from David Adu. Uh, Papa J says, um, this government has no plans on how to provide jobs, especially for the youth. There's no plan for the youth. And unfortunately, COVID-19 has hit us and everybody else so hard. Uh, another message uh, says, how do you become an entrepreneur when the business climate isn't conducive for those who are already in the industries that are coupled with high interest rates and government has high appetite for borrowing? So, um, Mame, what are the areas that maybe young people uh, are interested in such that government can probably channel some energies there so that we can find jobs for young people because many of us worry mm -hmm. about the future of our children right. and what opportunities even lie ahead for them and this is really because there's a view that young people are not interested in agriculture <laughs> right um obviously so you have to also know that interest is formed by so many things so maybe young people may be interested in um, nursing but it may not be because nursing is something they want to do but it's because they heard that nursing pays well so one of the key things, that, but it all goes back to the educational system because interest is formed over there. However, the key things that would, the realistic things that will actually drive our economy would be agriculture. But how do you make it, I remember one of the panel um, speakers was saying, the, the CEO of Eden Tree, she said, in quotes, make agriculture attractive, right? Or make for, it sexy. Sexy. I was like, okay, maybe for, for daytime TV, can I use that <laughs> word? But yes, make agriculture sexy, right? And the idea is that, okay, how do you take te bring technology into the agriculture space, right? And there's so many, these young guys who can hack and do all kinds of stuff. And I'm like... You but know, young people seem more interested in tech-based That's issues. what I'm about. So you, how do so you take you these So you see a lot of right. uh, startups that are focused on the fintech, right. or the financial, uh, um, you know, technology industry, uh -huh. payment 
you know, <laughs> making things easier using technology seems right. to be the area people are going or interested in. But let's be realistic also. With these fintech things and the, the, the tech space, a lot of things are also being driven by Silicon Valley. So, and the countries that are actually drawing most, the most investment in Africa, South Africa, Nigeria, Ghana hasn't even bringing as much in terms of investment into, into startups and tech, the tech space, right? Because how do you even make payments easy when you don't have money? That's why I'm thinking that being realistic and the, the low hanging fruits, right? I started a farm last year, coconut farm. I don't have a farming background, nothing, right? And it's in my, in my mom's hometown. And so I, did, I had to do that because I was being realistic as to what the situation was. So let's say Indonesia, right? They're the highest um, producers of palm oil. I was saying that, and I was saying that even uh, the farming thing doesn't just represent going to the farm and yeah. tilling the soil. Yeah. Farming has so many um, aspects to it. You can even end up becoming a food nutritionist. You can even, even the, um, what is uh, engineering? We have um, young guys in, in, the, in the agri business space creating machines to make processing easy. So it's engineering also. And just quickly just say this, that um, what I was trying to say about even the farming thing is that we need to be able to um, work on the minds of our people so that they can prioritize, right? So there's something called, you know, um, psychology, right? Our government can employ that method. So what they did in some regions, like they do what they call, they regulate consumer behavior. You can regulate what the people want to consume, want to consume. whether it's food and even information. Yeah. So even when the, like, if you're supposed to start eating palm, like palm oil or using like a dawa dawa situation with the COVID, somebody used that example. The president said one thing on TV and what happened to the price of the food. So our government can actually start using a multidisciplinary approach to create development projects, right? Where you're working with psychologists, okay, how do we create adverts to start making Ghanaians start eating this? How do we do to get the youth to start being interested in this? So it is not just a one, oh my God, this policy is great on paper, let's establish it. Let us sit down and now begin to assess a, a more sustainable approach. If the, you see, infrastructure, eh? policy is infrastructure, it's soft infrastructure. If it's effective, when you roll it out, Believe me, it begins to work itself out that even it will touch the cleaner. It is so sophisticated, it is well, well established, but it takes time to develop it. So we shouldn't be quick. I think the knee jerk thing of, okay, people are crying. Okay, hello everyone, we are going to create a policy to just satisfy so you can shut up. No, now work with everybody, work with the psychology, the scientists. Everyone is involved and let us come up with a proper policy for youth employment to ensure that this thing will, will live to even touch your kids and your children's children. Mm -hmm. That is what we want our governments to do. And I, I put On, that also. Poku, um, I think cocoa production is a classic example of government support for a sector for which revenues you know, depend on. And it would be, government is the biggest spender, is the biggest owner of property, is the one with the biggest resources, capital investment. So that's why it may seem unfair to say, well, the public sector payroll is full. Go and be an entrepreneur. <laughs> no. see, so you see, no, what, what we, we must, and what we must appreciate is that even the public sector, there are persons who work within the public sector who find it difficult trying to take care of their families. I mean, it's I not know, true that people don't become wealthy no, in the no, public sector. No, 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 no. I, I know graduates. I know mates who take less than 3,000 cities a month. And I wonder how they are able to survive mm -hmm. with 3,000 cities a month. But get to uh, 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 Okanshi, where I used to work, I mean, as a, as a business person. There are people who make 3,000 cities profit on a venture that they are engaged in, in a day. So it tells you that, I mean, if you really would want to see... 3,000 a month, that should even be a very higher level because, after all, even the NAPCO people, how much are we paying them? Is it not? Well, but, that no, I, I am looking at um, the, the mainstream uh, public service. I mean, yeah. No, you have people who earn just about 1,000 to 1,000. I tell you, they are great five. graduates in, at NHIA, at most of these big, big names that we hear that make less than 2,000 cities in a month. Out of these 2,000, they will pick, the, 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 that's what they use for transport, they feed themselves with it, and all of that. It's a challenge. It's, I mean, the pressure on the public press is huge. And that is why the call for people to now engage in the private sector, for me, is important. Luckily for us as Africans, we now have the uh, uh, African 
uh, free trade uh, uh, agreement. The after. The after. How do we take advantage of it? How do we prepare the private sector, the young entrepreneurs, to take advantage of this um, uh, big market that has closed about three trillion GDP uh, and, and all of that? How do we help, uh, how do we ensure that young people take advantage of it? That should be the discussion of the youth, because you see, consistently what we have heard is that when policymakers bring out solutions, we tend to describe them as knee jerk. Uh, as not being sustainable and all of that. But as young people ourselves, we are not forthcoming with solutions. It has always been complaints. If we think that the government policies that are in place, policies that are taking experts, I mean, technical people, people who have risen to the level of cabinet ministers and all of that, to put in place is not working. Let's come together as young people and prefer solutions. We've been doing that, but nobody listens. No, I, I, I doubt it. You see, you don't. Okay. <laughs> I, I doubt it in the sense that mm -hmm. I doubt it. In the, you see, and I, I was I was at the conference center listening to most of these uh, young people make presentations. I sat throughout mm -hmm. most of the presentations for the Youth Connect conference. the Youth Connect conference. Mm -hmm. yeah, and you realize that it is one complaint. We, we we want to do this. We want government to do this. We want government to do this. But what level of pressure are you putting on government? I wonder if even we have come together to even write a policy proposal. A position paper. A position maybe. paper and present it to government, even come on TV3, given the opportunity, you present it so that the public know that the youth has solution to the many challenges that we think that government is doing. We are not doing it. I think it. that's a good idea for yes. thought leadership. Maybe they got that the Startup Act, to be fair, that's what I'm trying to say, that it's, to be fair, the Ghana Startup Act has been done. It was done last year. They've been struggling to get government attention. That's what I'm saying to you, that honestly speaking, if you're looking for propositions or, or, or solutions from the youth, there are a bunch yes, of them. Yes. We can produce it even tomorrow if you want, if no. you will give the audience. So you see, so you see, so I think this is where maybe the well, National I, I want, Youth Authority, us, yes, the National Youth to, Authority to needs to, to be maybe a coordinating um, yes. anchor. I have, I have yeah. told them. I mean, I, I was at I was at the meeting there. I told them that they they need to coordinate all activities from a youth employment agency to NYA, from NAPCO to NYA, from a, a national service to NYA, so that they are able to build data of youth who even need support in the agri sector young people who need support in the ICT sector because information sharing is critical. My sister says that she doesn't even know of the Business Resource Center. It is not her fault. There has to be a, a, an avenue, a platform where she can easily access such information, which is lacking. And that is why and the benefit. And I think the critical thing beyond the Youth Resource Center is the benefits mm. that young people are entitled to. I know the, the shoe, shoe uh, producer, um, Hosman Shoes. Okay. All right, yeah. I understand he said he heard there was uh, something about tax breaks for young people mm -hmm. operating over a certain period. He went to the GRA. The GRA <laughs> says they were unaware of it. So I think that's something that is, we, so we that, need. That is, the, that is, that so, is that, why... so that the tax breaks we are giving big entities, the GRA needs to be aware. Mm -hmm. If you're a company, a uh, small business, you are your turnover is what you are entitled, or if you've been operating for two, or you want to start operating over a five-year period, you have these breaks to to cushion you. Yeah. I agree. I agree with you. I mean that. Okay. Yes. Yes. You finish off, and the, then Honorable the, Adams will come in. So, so the, the the support that needs to be, or that that is being given to the youth, must must be explained to them properly. I have a private company. Um, I mean, I provide services in the I ICT. Sometimes, even even um, my office, when it comes to uh, issues surrounding tax, we have difficulties with that. As a member of parliament, from where I sit, mm -hmm. the kind of people that I know, mm -hmm. I have challenges with that. You understand? And that is why the Ghana Enterprises Agency has been um, is, is now mandated to do. The old MBSSI. Yeah, the old MBSSI. So, so you realize that recently uh, the M Ghana Enterprises Agency and the World Bank are giving some facilities to uh, businesses. As a member of parliament, what I have done is that these uh, people who do the etting where are you are people and 
I, I brought them together, formed associations. In, and they they applied. in your constituency? Yes, in my constituency. And they applied. Mm -hmm. And just yesterday, I'm being told that people have been given 5,000 CDs and, and all of that. You understand? So, it's the lack of information that for me is, is challenging. Okay. Government goes through a lot of efforts to put up policies. But if they are not working, we should find a way of preferring solutions and, 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 and if possible, meeting with government agencies. We are not doing the same. We are not even taking advantage of uh, young parliamentary forums. Uh, there are like that? Yes, but... Uh, okay, so I, th I think there's that gap. Yes, yeah. Honorable Adams. Uh, what, what it is should be that you must always find space to involve the young people in whatever decisions that you mm -hmm. make. So you don't have this gap. Mm -hmm. It seems like we are thinking for them, implementing for them, driving for them, and expect them to know and be part of it. I think that there should be a change of approach. We need to involve them right from the word go so that we can have the youth produce, youth led and government support kind of arrangement. Then they will be deeply involved. But if we sit somewhere and think that, okay, we are doing this, there's youth resource centers. Even where these resource centers exist, how many young persons in that area are even aware? In situations where institutions get name changed and sometimes even look like MBSSI today is changing to something else. Someone doesn't really know what it is that they are doing, so it's no longer in existence. We started with uh, uh, YES. YES has changed to N, uh, NEIP, but change of name, change of location, and all kinds of things. Lack of proper information for the young persons who are supposed to be benefiting from this. And let's reduce the knee-jerk uh, 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 policies. That's a fact. Like, you are, you are rightly saying that in October, NAPCO, the first badge who were taking mm -hmm. and announced, will come to an end. Just before that comes to an end, the one who controls the pace is telling us that the public sector is choked. It's almost so, like, uh, so, uh, it's almost like just preparing your mind <laughs> preparing for your the mind that ahead. That we cannot absorb you. So you, your, your program will come to an end and you may get out there. So start thinking mm -hmm. out there. Out there also, we have not created the environment and situation to be able to really absorb them. Okay. So it becomes like there was a problem. We wanted to just absorb them. So we introduced it and then we thought that that is the end of it. It cannot be the end of it. Okay, there but are so Honorable many things. Adams, you used to be a tutor yeah. uh, at a senior high school. Yeah. There are lots of schools without teachers. Exactly. Isn't exactly a that point. a viable option for young people? Mm -hmm. Teaching. It's a viable option. And I believe that there are a lot of young persons who are so frustrated that they have been trained and are kept asking this question. As part of the NAPCO program, graduates who are not from colleges of education, who have not been trained even how to teach, have been recruited and posted to second cycle schools to go and teach. Then you have graduates who have gone through colleges of education, trained on how to teach, have passed their exams. They are told that there's also another exam called the Lancentia exams. You need to pass that one before you are posted to go and teach. Meanwhile, in the same classroom, are persons who have not been trained how to teach who are in there teaching as NAPCO teachers. So you ask yourself, what, what, what is all this policy about? That one who has been trained how to do the job, like a journalist who has gone through GIJ, trained, he or she has passed her exams, is refused an opportunity to work in, say, GBC or any other uh, 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 media house. But someone else who just did maybe psychology or something, as an example, is now brought into that media house to come and do exactly what you have been trained to do because they say there was some license that you didn't pass. Kofi, there's also the group of people who have been trained to teach. Um, and now I'm coming, that they I'm no coming, longer want to teach. Um, of course, you have, work you, in you have <laughs> they want to work you in the bank. You have those ones. I'm worried about those who are still struggling 
looking for the space when we do not have enough teachers, but they are not being given. So it is not the case that Ghanaian youth who have been trained don't want to teach. Mm. I want to state that there are a lot of young persons today, if we say we want to recruit them to teach, you would you will get more than you need to fill all the spaces that we have. You have them out there struggling every day. I'm sure you have received some of them who are asking for such opportunity. I have had to engage a deputy minister for education, looking for, and he's telling me that they open the portal, they should monitor. When they open the portal, then they put in their, their mm -hmm. application. So it is not that people do not want to teach, but there's so much frustration. Look, nursing, look at the patient to nurses ratio. So bad, come to my region, or uh, in the OT region, mm. you do, we do not have enough nurses. As for doctors, they're the least said about it, the better. Mm. But there are a number of doctors that have been trained. They have passed their exams, but they are not being employed and to be posted out to go oh, and really? work. Yes, there are nurses who have finished their nursing. Oh, no, yeah, no. they are that doctors. Is, that no, is true. That's they're, they're, doctors. Yes, so I doctors think who have passed. I think a month ago when I treated the agenda 111, mm. One of the concerns of some of the nurses uh, from the 2019 batch yes. till now is that they've not been employed. It was an instructive discussion because Agenda 111, what it means is that we need human resource to fill those hospitals. If we don't start the training... And even the also now. now. How we, exactly. Yes, so, because there are these hospitals which haven't even been opened. Exactly. There are nurses and exactly. other health professionals exactly. still hanging. We need to push them in. That, that's another angle. That, so that is why many of us were worried that even the admissions for nursing training for the year 2021 academic year has been stalled. Mm. Because if truly what the president said, that by the end of next year, his Agenda 111 facilities will be done, meaning that is going to be huge opportunity for young people in the health sector. sector. Now you have a government. You have a government be going that, to school in January. You have a so government, no, that have stalled the they should have been in by now. Yeah. That have stalled that process. It takes how many years to train? It will take about three years to, to train an average nurse. And now you say you will be finishing these facilities next year. We should be building more health training facilities. You haven't built more, but you are delaying the training of others. So you ask yourself, so are we really thinking right? Okay. Is it the case that, uh, 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 as some people are saying, our teacher institutions are not training people right, or we are not pushing policy? As she said, if government knows that I am doing Agenda 111 and truly I will finish it, I will need doctors, I will need nurses. Why should any such government delay the process of admission of these persons? Okay. Why should persons who have been admitted be told to hold on for, for the meantime? Government is engaging in some other activities. Talk about agri again. We have these school feeding programs. We have free SHS that goes with its own feeding. You can dictate and direct what they are fed. If you invest in your poultry industry, X could be supplied to all schools from this, from this investment. And so funds will be revolving, chicken products. Instead of them buying imported products, the they will buy from... So we need to, we need to get the cycle they, right. They, so, they, yeah. so, so we, we are running out of time. Right. Uh, so, Mami, your quick final points, and then I'll come to the Honorable Poku. Okay, so I think two things. Just number one, I think we need to focus on also decentralizing development in Ghana. Um, people talk about the fact that the youth don't want to go to the other remote areas, other regions, and also it's because People don't, maybe there's no access to internet, things about electricity and stuff. And of course, if they are young and they get married, they need to put their children in school. So Absolutely. I think for any role that you're posting anyone outside uh, an urban area, there needs to be these add-ons such that they can stay. Right, so yeah, incentivize. So the, 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 you need to just think of how we can decentralize development in Ghana. Everything is in Accra. Accra is getting Kumase, choked. Takamade, Kumase, Takade, exactly. Coast, exactly. Tamale. And it's getting, it's making life very expensive. But if we're able to spread our development we will be able to um, we get used to go out. And the last thing I want to say is really get, if you're talking about you want to engage the youth, we don't want um, older people making decisions for people that, they, you know, they're not walking in the young person's shoes. You're not earning, if you're in government or you're an MP, you're not earning 1,000 CDs a month. You don't know what it's like to get up, people waiting for trot for hours, walking in the sun, selling toffees. 
You don't know what it's like. You get the salary it. of the MP is very bad. So it's not that bad. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, you know, don't, don't, don't offend. Bad. Don't offend. <laughs> don't, don't offend Ghanaians. But the salary, the salary is bad. Okay, so the assumption is that the salary in these places are good. So you know what? Let us be. But you have benefits, Honorable Poku. But anyway, so can I end and say, let us all just be genuinely honest about where Ghana is now. Let us be practical. Let, let's look at homegrown solutions to make this country work. And really speak, um, genuinely speaking, I just wish that the, 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 the ministers would begin to engage the SMEs, have meetings with them and ask them questions because they contribute to the job. Um, they, they create most of like 70 to 8% of jobs in Ghana and they are suffering. If you give them an audience, ask them, well, how can we help you? Even if we can't help you, how do we even stay out of your that way? That meeting should be then, held with the Ghana Revenue Authority. Also, yes. yes. So yeah, right. I'll end with that. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Mami. Yes, Honorable Poku, your final thoughts. So my final thoughts are that, one, as young people, we should, we should be looking out for information. Yes, it has to be provided by government. But it's also important that we appreciate what is happening around us. Like I said, um, you talked about some of the difficulties in living outside Accra, and you mentioned the internet. About 90% of districts in Ghana, capital, district capitals in Ghana, are connected to 4G. I mean, they have 4G internet virtually. You know. I'm sure if you go to Boim on your phone, actually, you have. Uh, I think the, the vault, I, I the think the fiber optic has been laid from Accra here over up to uh, uh, Boku yes. in the Upper East. Region. So, yes. so which uh, passes through six regions. So Greater Accra, Eastern mm. Region, yes. Volta Region, Oti Region, Northern Region, North East, and then Upper East. Yes. Of course, huge, every, so huge everywhere, uh, and I travel a lot, everywhere I've gone to, especially when I'm in the capital, I get very access to some good internet. Um, though it's expensive, we need to find a way of reducing the cost of internet. But um, I also appreciate the concerns that we have raised. And I have, I have, I have for instance, on the Startup Act, mm -hmm. it's something that I was looking for it on the internet. I, I did not see a okay. copy. Uh, I, I would want to pick it up okay. as a young person in parliament mm -hmm. and see how we are able to push it out there. I don't know. So was it proposed by government or is no, it a private it was, member? It was, it was private sector. So it was a, so, a bunch of um, this young people in, in the business space who came up with it because it was implemented in Tunisia. To so, see how yeah. we are able to push it. Okay, um, wonderful. Then I'll yeah, let so, Because sometimes um, when you put such, you, you push some of these private members, mm -hmm. when it comes to cost, mm -hmm. the government is a bit adamant in trying to. So probably what we can do is to propose to the Ministry of Trade or even the Ministry of uh, Business Support I think it's been, been, it's been scrapped, uh -huh. but Ministry of Trade and It's not an State. agency under the office of the president or Of something. the president. Mm -hmm. So we see how best we are able to push it. Mm -hmm. We are there, as young people, we are there to help push the youth agenda. What is important is that we try and connect. We have social media that easily connects us. Let's try and connect and see how best we are able to make the necessary uh, uh, noise and push to get things done. We, we, uh, we, are, we are available. But and we, are, we are doing our bit, and it has to be appreciated. Okay, oh, that's so, <laughs> so we'll be chasing you uh, more on that. Mm -hmm. And I want to say many thanks to our guests, to the Honorable Davis Opoku and Sahis, the MP for Mpriso, uh, to the Honorable Kofi Adams, the MP for Buem, and also to Mame Awinado, International Trade Consultant with Blackbridge Consulting. My name is Jifa Bampo. Many thanks to our production team and our studio team as well. We've been watching Key Points from TV3 and listening live on 3FM. I'm Jifa Bampo. Join us again next week for another edition. Up next, of course, is Warm Up Plus with Yao Ofosu Labi and Aniela Alote. Have a good Saturday. <laughs>